Sex is the life force energy that runs through us all. Can you use sexual energy for your spiritual evolution or perhaps for emotional healing? Is it even possible? Clinical sexologist Dr. Martha Tara Lee will explore all these and more on Eros Evolution on Own Times Radio. Hello, hello, and welcome to Arrow's Evolution. This is where sexuality and spirituality meet. My name is Martha. I'm a clinical sexologist based in Singapore, and my company is called Arrow's Coaching, and you can find me at eroscoaching.com. Every week I have a different guest, or I uh, have myself on it, and sometimes I, I do a show where I summarize all the 12 or 13 so episodes. And today I'm very glad it's it's been... A long time planning, and I have with me Carl Franco. We're going to be talking about how you can create a positively pleasurable relationship. And as we know, life is challenging, relationships more so. In this interview today, author and sex and relationship expert Carl Franco will be discussing with us how to manage the inevitable conflicts in your relationship and co create a connection that's built on a positive attitude and skillful communicating. Carl Frankel is a writer and journalist specializing in sex and relationships for his most recent book, Secrets of the Sex Masters. He interviewed 16 of the world's best sex teachers and in partnership with them turned the interviews into chapters providing guidance on subjects such as genital anatomy, extended orgasm, tantra, oral sex, touch, and of course, sex and shame. Sex, uh, Secrets of the Sex Masters received the 2015 Book of the Year Prize from ASEC, which stands for the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, of which I am a member of, and it is really quite an achievement. He also has a 2013 book, Love and the More Perfect Union, Six Keys to Relationship Bliss, which provides a unique take on relationship challenges and opportunities. And Jamie Turnoff, who is a couples therapist, said this about the book. It creatively combines established principles of relationship happiness with an original and useful map and model. And you can find out more about our guest today, Carl Frankel, by going to this website, intimatearts.center.com. That art, that's arts with an S and center spelled with a E R, so C N T R. Intimatearts.center.com. So welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you very much, Martha. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. I'm so excited. Today we're talking about <laughs> pleasurable relationships. And often I, I talk about sex, so it would be really amazing to uh, hear from you. And so uh, so let's go on to the show uh, directly, quickly. <laughs> Why is relationship harmony, you feel, so difficult to achieve? Well, it certainly is. I know lots of people in long-term relationships, and some of them are quite good, but they're really stressful. And I think... The main reason is that we tend to choose partners who we think are going to solve our problems, but it's, they don't solve them simply by being the wonderful, perfect match that we think they are. They're perfect in a different way. They give us the opportunity to, to work through issues, childhood issues, childhood um, emotional senses of not being fulfilled the way we want to, and they give us a new environment in which we can work through these issues. So there's really relationship is not only a pleasure, it is also a project, and the project is really to find a kind of peace in our inner selves that wasn't present before, and our partner helps us do that work. If they're a good partner, we stick it out and we make it work together. Mm. I like what you're saying, that uh, pleasure, pleasure uh, can also be a project, and then we find peace. So three Ps, uh, pleasure, project, and peace. So I've often said yep. that our relationship is uh, like an a ongoing workshop, and it is meant for those people who are the most courageous and able to 
work on uh, themselves and actually relationship being the hardest thing we can do which also helps us to uh, evolve. <laughs> it's it's so very it's very true. Your, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Um well it's it's very true and the other piece of this is that the longer you're with somebody, the more they become familiar. And familiar is a word we all know, but it may not be immediately obvious to people that it also has to do with the word family. So that hot, sexy connection we had, um, and that's what launches us is into a love relationship, the, literally the biochemicals of love, like mm -hmm. oxytocin and, and, and uh things like that, actually they have a maximum shelf life of four years, usually two to four years. So after that, what we would find ourselves, we fell in love, we had this perfect partner who's going to be wonderful. All of a sudden, we see that they're not the perfect person they were. They get to know us. We're not so interesting to them. They're not so interesting to us. And they become familiar in the sense of being family. And that's a tough one because you're not supposed to have sex with people who are if you're, if you're family members. It produces weird offspring. So there are all these kinds of rules. So people tend in long-term relationships to desexualize their connection because it becomes a family. They become like siblings. And that becomes a separate challenge. And, and all these things are sort of the natural entropy of relationship. But there's an antidote. And the antidote is to really be mm -hmm. conscious and to choose to override these natural patterns by bringing conscious choice every day to how you relate to your partner and to what you do with your partner. Mm, beautiful. I really appreciate you bringing this piece because when you're familiar with someone, then uh, they become family, like you said. Uh, what I have been telling my clients is that the honeymoon phase is over. So would you say that the biochemical of love, which uh, changes after two, or four, two to four years, as you mentioned, is uh, when the honeymoon phase dies off? You, usually that's the case. Now, I know literally in my entire life, I know one person who has says to me, I've been married 30 years and I've been madly in love every minute. That God bless them, I'm, but it's not a common thing. Usually things fade and then you have to kind of reinvent the relationship. You have to reinvent why you're in it. You may not be in it because the sex is amazing or because it creates totally transcendent experiences. You may be in it because you have a life you're building together. You may be in it because you're raising kids. Um, hopefully you're in it to work through your issues and to learn and learn how to be more happy and to ha learn how to connect on a more ongoing and uh, uh, less bouncy and tempestuous way, volatile way, than in the past. So I mean, the, it's a real learning project, long-term relationship, and the learning that happens, it's really a ha course in, in happiness more than anything else. Mm. Or, an, or an unhappiness if you, if you are an unhappiness if you don't succeed, right? Mm. So I love what you're saying, making conscious choices, reinvent the wheel. So I assume that people who don't uh, are making uh, mistakes uh, in their relationships. What, in your opinion, are some of the most common uh, mistakes that partners make? Oh, boy. I could go on for an hour just talking about the mistakes people make. But I think the first, <laughs> the, the first thing that people do, and everybody is inclined to this, and it's really a practice is, Let's just say, Martha, you and I are in a relationship, and you say something that upsets me, um, and I have a reaction. My, my contract, energetically, I contract. It's natural to lash back, to say, well, you're not so hot either, or it's not my fault, or you always say mm -hmm. that, or something that's reactive and hostile. And that's kind of par for the course. In fact, we live in a culture that where hostility and putting people down and being snarky and sarcastic kind of is perceived as cool and having value culturally. So we get really mm -hmm. wrong lessons about communication uh, fed to us by our culture. The, but the thing that people mm -hmm. don't do is, in that moment where, just for purposes of example, you say something to me and I get triggered, I don't take a breath, mm -hmm. I don't sit with it, and I don't respond in an appropriate way. I respond from a fight or fight place um, rather than from a let's figure out what my part, what you were really saying, what did you really mean? Is there merit in it? How do I feel about this? How did I feel saying it? 
you can actually have a dialogue about that if you do it skillfully, but most people just tend to litigate things or go on the attack when they feel hurt. Mm. It's your and you don't learn how to do it. We, and we have no, no way of learning what the tragedy culturally is that we don't teach people how to manage anger and manage when the people when they're hurt or upset. It, but there's no way to learn it. We have to learn that on our own, or we never learn it at all. Yeah, it's very true. Or learn it through a therapist, with a therapist like you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the, the break just came up uh, very quickly. I was so engrossed. So after this break, we'll come back with Carl Frankel talking about pleasurable relationships. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Om Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hi. I'm Kelly Fox, host and astrologer of The Astrology Show. Each week, I'll give you access to the current transits, which are a valuable tool that provide astrological information to help unlock the potential each of us has. Understanding the stars can help steer us in the right direction to make better informed choices. So if you're wondering what's going to happen in your week ahead, be sure to tune in to The Astrology Show for guidance. Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. It's 6.42 p.m. Time for Steve Plato and his son Dylan to do the dishes. They talk about everything from the yuckiness of girls to the awesomeness of his soccer team. Sometimes they don't talk at all. Then, okay. the dreaded <laughs> splash fight. It's dad o'clock, and it's the best time of the day. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. And welcome back to Arrow's Evolution. This is where sexuality and spirituality meet. We are talking about how to create a positively pleasurable relationship with Carl Frankel. And uh, you can find him at Intimate Arts Center. That's arts with an S and center, C-N-T-E-R. Welcome back to the show, Carl. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And... Uh, just before break, we were talking about how uh, couples in long-term relationships uh, become familiar and in turn become uh, family and therefore they stop having sex. So we then went into the re mistakes that uh, couples are making. And you were starting to say that we get upset and then we go into reaction mode. We get hostile and then we start to uh, unleash and uh, attack our partners. So, uh, is there anything you want to elaborate, or uh, are there other mistakes that uh, um, couples are making? Well, I will I'll elaborate on that a bit. Um, I think m most people listening to this will uh, identify with what I'm saying. Um, relationships ha are like weather systems. Uh, we can be in a cranky mood, like there's a cranky oppressive weather system, there's normal nice weather, then there's spectacular, magical day. And we can really feel the difference in our bodies. You know, we, there's, the, there's like the easy getting along with your partner, there's in a hostile or angry space with your partner, then there's the kind of bliss of tenderness and connection that can happen. Um, this is sort of the range of emotions. Now, what happens is, again, to come back to the example, I'm cranky, you've done something that annoyed me, annoys me. So what my impulse is to do at that moment is to deal with the issue while I'm feeling cranky. That's probably going to backfire because it's not clear that I actually want to resolve the issue if I'm feeling cranky. Maybe I want to complain. Maybe I want to make my partner wrong. Maybe I want to litigate the issue and win. 
the big mistake that I'm referring to here is once people, once partners get uh, in conflict or at odds, disagree with each other, they often move into what I call the courtroom. They tend to debate as if there's some judge who's going to determine who's right, who's wrong, who's at fault, mm. who's at not. And you can't win that one because if you and I are a couple and we get in that argument and I win the argument, I've lost yeah. because you're yeah. distant, you're hurt, I'm on top of you and not in a good way, in a bad way. So the moral of this story is conflict happens, un upset happens. Mm. Timing is everything. Choose the, the time to talk about it when you're actually getting along with your partner, not when you're feeling like you've got to prove something to them or make them wrong or prove you were right or put them in their place or whatever that might be. So don't litigate. Don't litigate in the courtroom ever. If you got those issues, take them to a therapist or wait till you're in a space and a mood where you can smile at your partner when, when you like your partner and really want to work things through in a way that really is going to feel good for you both. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a, a big piece um, down there, uh, not go into reaction and to not litigate. And uh, I certainly see, certainly seen some such couples who do that. And uh, they, they keep having the same fights and the same reactions, and um, they, they never have get it resolved. And um, so they actually get uh, into this vicious cycle, and it really kills the love and romance in the relationship. So Ab absolutely what? right. Right, right. Um, well, I, I, did you have a question following on that? I'm sorry, I interrupted Mark. Uh, no, no, please go ahead. Well, in my book, Love and the More Perfect Union, I actually devise a sort of, I say relationship is a house with five rooms. And the main three rooms mm -hmm. is like a railroad flat, one, one to five. And the, you know, when, when you're breaking up and you just hate your partner and it's an awful, I call that the dungeon. I mean, just like the end of the world is coming. Your partner will never understand you. It's just the awfulest thing ever. Um, that's the, I mean, therapists will call that the image of the bad mother or the bad father. It's like the the, every, the, the, your partner represents everything that's bad about your primary caregiver in that space. Then you have the courtroom where you're feeling cranky and basically hostile and argumentative, and you bring your inner lawyer into the conversation. You try to win. You try to make the other person wrong. You litigate. And as I say, that's kind of doomed. The more time you spend in the courtroom, the less happier and positive your relationship is going to be. Then there's a space called mm -hmm. the cafe, which is where you just – you know, what do you do in cafes? You have nice, con pleasant mm. conversations with people. It's not intimate. It's not the bedroom. You're not naked. It's a social space. But you're really just getting along. And that's a fabulous way to be in a relationship. Just having a companion who you laugh with easily and have light conversations with is a fine thing. But it only becomes really meaningful if it's accompanied by what I call the bedroom, which is not necessarily only sex, but this special kind of tenderness and intimate connection that, are, that is a function of intimate sexual love. So mm -hmm. the third room in the center between the courtroom, the cafe, and the bedroom, the bedroom is where, you know, you eye gaze and you just open your heart to your partner and feel love for them their failings, which are inevitable because we all have them. Then the fifth room is like this blissful, transcendent state of connection, which I call the meadow after a wonderful poem by the uh, Sufi poet Rumi, out beyond right and wrong, there's a meadow. I'll meet you there. And anybody who's had the good fortune to be with their, with their beloved in the meadow knows whereof I speak. It is a spectacularly beautiful place to be, but it's a miracle when it happens. You're not going to live there. Mm. Yeah. It's also that state of um, where they transcend everything and are in complete union with each other, what you feel after an orgasm. I'm sorry. Say that, say that once more, Martha. I'm so sorry. Yeah, the, the fifth room that you're mentioning, which is bliss, a transcendent state, is what... Yes people feel after they have had an orgasm yes yes absolutely <laughs> um it, in a very in a in a very transient way but i would also say that they're different 
levels of orgasmic bliss. And I'm not just talking about a little orgasm or a big orgasm. Mm. I'm talking about um, how, which of the chakras are engaged. So there can be spectacular sex when it's only the sex chakra and the root chakra that are involved. And so it can be really an amazing connection, but it can be genital. But what happens when the heart is totally open? when the voice is totally open, when the third eye, when the intuitive part of your body is clear, the real bliss moments to me come when all those, when you're connecting at all the levels people can connect on, in the heart, in the voice, in the crown chakra, in the power center. Uh, now, this may sound kind of woo-woo and out there to people, but again, if you... Um, if you have these moments of transcendent connection, it's about sex and it's about sharing this extraordinary gift that we've been given, which is the gift of sexual connection and sexual pleasure. But ultimately, that you can you don't get beyond right and wrong unless it's a whole psyche, whole soul experience, and that's really what I'm referring to. Mm. Yeah, I I definitely agree with you. I believe that with uh, practices. Uh, it can become easier to attain this state, but first of all, you need to be able to get along. <laughs> so, okay, there are five rooms. <laughs> exactly. The first one. Okay, there are five rooms. Yes. The first one is end of the world. Second is uh, where you have lots of bites. The second one is um, uh, no. Uh, first one is end of the world. You have that feeling of uh, being judged, and you just feel totally yucks. The second one is courtroom right. where you are fighting, and you bring out your inner lawyer. The third one is cafe where you're just chilling, getting along with each other. The fourth one is the bedroom, where there's tenderness, eye-gazing, love, uh, sex, I guess. And the fifth one is uh, bliss. So there are five yes. rooms, and so we need to be aware of them and be mindful Absolutely. about what you we're choosing. You, and, and it's sort of good, you sort of take the weather temperature, if you will. You can go, you know, you can go, wow, this has been a really cranky conversation. My partner and I are in the courtroom. I don't, do I really want to be there? And then you can say to your partner, hey, we're in the courtroom. You want to try to hang out in the cafe now? The reality is that these emotions are, are biochemical. They're in our body. So it's, you might be able to go, let's just relate differently, but you might need to take a little time off and go and clear your head and go for a walk or, you know, whatever works for you to sort of decompress because um, you can't necessarily just pretend you're doing fine when you're really feeling annoyed with your partner. Every time is a wonderful vehicle, so just a little pat, take some time off, come back, and you can really be in a different, a different weather system will have come in, so that's one way to make it work. Okay, so be aware of which room you are in and then uh, choose. So what are some other ways in which you can create a happier and better partnership? Um, well, one of the things that my partner Sherry and I do, and uh, mm -hmm. for those who don't know, my partner is Sherry Winston, who is a uh, sex educator who also won a prize for a, a book she wrote about about sex and sex education. So. So one of the things that Sherry and I try to do every day is we cuddle for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I, we have different sleeping patterns. So I get up at 6 in the morning. She gets up late in the morning. I try to join her for 10 or 15 minutes. It's not about sex. It's about connecting, and it's about creating an intention of how we want to be with each other for the day. So really what we're trying to, what we're trying to do is go, let's not be automa on automatic pilot today. We've been together 10 years. We have all the issues that people have been together for 10 years have and what we, so what we say is what do we want to do how do we want to be with each other one of my favorite um you know and and whatever you know it's creative process so it'll always be different but one of the ones we've been working with lately is um and excuse my language we use this just for humor but it's support the shit out of each other so really support each mm -hmm. other today and 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 then if it doesn't happen if i if sherry says something and i say something cranky or i don't hear or i don't answer or any of the ways i can give an unsatisfactory response the rules of the game go hey we were going to have a support the shit out of it. Want to give me a supportive response? And all of a sudden, I'm reminded mm. that we have this rule for the day. So it's really about making it conscious and making every day kind of an improv. We have habitual behavior, familiar behavior, 
But what makes us feel really alive when we enter, is when we claim our free will and our choice. So what we try to do, and this is about being fully alive ultimately, relationship is a great opportunity for that. So what we try to do is stay alive in the moment and have little exercises and kind of mantras, if you will, that allow us to rem- that make it easier for us to not become unconscious and to be the best person we can be in the relationship. Mm, I love it. And any other tips that you have? Well, it's um, yes, um, it's and it's about the positively pleasurable relationship. Um, has two mm. really important words besides relationship: positive and pleasurable. So, pleasurable. Have mm. and what is pleasure? It's not only physical pleasure and sexual pleasure. It might be mm. conversational pleasure. It might be walking in mm. nature pleasure. It might be watching mm. a TV show you both love together pleasure. But mm. really, try to be positive, and try to be pleasurable. The other thing is, the more you uh, are negative, the more trouble you're going to have. Be positive. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that part. Positive and pleasurable. For more after this break. Free your mind with Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hi, this is Julie Geigel. And I'm Alicia Isaacs-Howes. And I'm Catherine Glass. And we're the Psychic Angel Channelers. You can find us every week here on Ohm Times Radio at Angel Talk Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. The angels have heard your call and are here to help. Are you ready to receive? Remember your magnificence with Angel Talk Tuesday. There is no death, only a change of worlds. Chief Seattle. Deborah Livingston is an award-winning intuitive psychic medium whose international services include mediumship, spiritual assessment, animal communication, and spiritual mentoring. She is a published author and a trained shaman. Deborah provides evidential messages from spirit and departed loved ones. Learn more at deblivemedium.com. That's D-E-B-L-I-V medium.com. I want to thank my mommy for loving me so much. For taking me to the doctor when I broke my foot. For leaving me alone when I wanted to be alone. And And now, as a grown-up, I'm thankful for being able to take care of you, my dear mom. For taking you to your therapies. For understanding that sometimes you simply want to be alone. Roles change without us noticing. That's why AARP gives you the information to provide even better care for your loved one. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. And you are listening to the, you are listening to Arrow's Evolution on the Om Times Radio Network, and you can share the show with your friends by sending this link, omtimes.com forward slash mobile. With this link, you will be able, you and your friends, will be able to listen to the show without needing to download any app. It's really cool. Well, we have Carl Frankel, and we are talking about how to create a positively pleasurable relationship. And just before break, he was introducing to us the five houses in uh, the five rooms in, her, in the house, and um, you can find it in his book, uh, Love and the More Perfect Union, Six Keys to Relationship Bliss, and it's his 2013 book. He's actually offering a free PDF of his book uh, to all listeners, and you can find it at this URL, that's tinyurl.com, one word, tinyurl.com, uh, backslash, uh, Carl's Free Gift. So it's one word, tinyurl.com, backslash, Carl's free gift. So get a free PDF of his book and uh, stay in touch with him. Go to his website, Intimate Arts Center. That's arts with an S and center, C-N-T-E-R.com. So, uh, Carl, welcome back to the show. 
we we want to talk about uh, communication in a relationship because you've been talking about the five uh, different rooms and you've been talking about the importance to be positive and to focus on pleasure in the relationship. And communication is a big piece. So uh, would you would you be able to elaborate a little bit more about what you can uh, say about communication in relationship? I will certainly try. Um, and this is kind of, we sort of take a 90 degree turn and come at this material, the material of relationship from a different place at this point. So I have certain stories sure. about the world. I, I have certain belief systems. I have certain belief systems about my partner, Sherry, is this and that and the next thing. I have certain stories about myself. I'm good at this. I'm bad at that. I'm proud of that. I'm ashamed of this. So we have all kinds of stories about who we are, who we partners are, and how the world works. What happens when mm -hmm. we communicate often is we get into debates about whose reality is more correct. So I say to Sherry, and this is not, has nothing to do with her. This is just totally hypothetical. You are mm -hmm. um, obsessive about X. She goes, no, I'm not obsessive about X. And we have an argument about whether she's obsessive about X or not. This really misses the point, and people do this all the time. They get into mm -hmm. debates and they litigate about stories they have about the world. But those stories always track back to something else. They start, track back first to observations. I have this story about Sherry or anybody because I observed or heard certain things that led me to draw the conclusions. That's an empirical truth. I saw this. I heard this. That's why I have this story. Underneath mm. that, that observation, that observation triggers feelings. So I have certain feelings about what I saw. Um, if it lends itself to a critical story about somebody or something. It's probably because I had a negative emotional response to it. And I had a negative emotional response because certain needs weren't being met. My need for um, be, to be heard or respected or to self-express. There are hundreds of needs that we all have and we all share. So the, the key to, one of the keys to communicating more effectively in relationship is to move from the domain of stories about the world to the domains mm -hmm. that are connected of feelings we have and needs we have. So um, mm -hmm. let's just say that I'm talking to Sherry and I want to say mm -hmm. X. She has heard me say something like this before and she goes impatient. She interrupts mm -hmm. me and goes, I, I've heard this. Just don't keep going on, okay? And all of a sudden, I contract because I want to say this, and she's telling me not to say it, and it's really frustrating. So instead of going, you never let me talk, or something like that, the better approach is to say to her something along the lines of, when you say that, I felt such and such. I felt unhappy, and I felt unhappy because my need for self-expression wasn't being met. All of a sudden, if we're talking about feelings, there's no debate. Sherry can't really argue about what I'm experiencing internally. She can't say, that was a wrong emotion to have, or you didn't really have that emotion. So all of a sudden we're talking mm -hmm. about subjective reality that's not really debatable, and it brings it to a hard mm -hmm. place because if I feel sad, usually your partner, even if they're mad at you, doesn't really want you to feel sad, so mm -hmm. people tend to be nicer mm -hmm. to each other. So the whole key up to this, and this is a long-winded explanation, is start, get out of your stories about the world and your partner and start talking about your feelings and the, and the needs that underlie those feelings. It'll it'll make a world of difference. Thank you so much for that. I I love what you're saying. Observation, feelings, and needs. Moving away from story, you can use this formula that you you have, which is when you that 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 I felt. Uh, I love it. So this is a big piece right. of communication, and it's it's what you learned uh, from uh, nonviolence communication. Yes, it's the this, there's a whole school of um, of communication around communication called nonviolent communication. It was founded by a psychologist named Marshall Rosenberg, who died a couple of years ago. It's absolutely brilliant, and it's used not only in the context of relationships. It's used in political situations. It's used to get 
make it easier for Palestinians to talk to Israelis and vice versa, where they're totally locked into stories about each other that literally are causing them to kill each other. So how do you get to, how do you get to the human commonality below the stories? And I would say you mostly got it, Martha, but I would add that thing, observations, too. So I have a story. The story is based on observations. The observation produce certain feelings, and the feelings are, are related to certain needs. So you don't have to say the observation. If you want to do it, by the book. It's useful, too. But it's really great if you go, when you said that, I had a feeling of anxiety arose in me because I, I, I felt because of my need for to be heard wasn't being met, or I believe that my need to be heard wasn't being met. That gives a clear cue to the partner to go, oh, well, I'd like to hear you, so let's try again and I'll try to hear you. All of a sudden it brings it into empathetic listening, the conversation, rather than into winning a debate. A huge difference there. Mm. That's great. So I, I really appreciate um, all the things that you're sharing with uh, communication. Is Is there any um, other things that uh, you would like to elaborate on? Well, it's this is How all part of the same connection. Yeah, it's it's all part of the same conversation, really. Um, mm. You want to feel safe with your partner. The more negative feedback you get coming to you, the more criticism or more more you're vigilant because you think they're going to be telling you what you did wrong or how you're lacking as a person or all the stuff couples will start communicating either you know overtly or covertly the more I have this negative stuff coming at me the more I'm going to go into a shell and the less I'm going to be open-hearted and able or desirous of spending time in the bedroom so this brings us back to be positive, and it doesn't mean just ignore the bad stuff, but just deal with it in a positive way and really be supportive of your partner. So just practice being supportive. There's, I, be, I believe, I've never seen studies, but I think there's probably a correlation. I Actually, I do know there's a correlation between um, the amount of positive communications that happen and the durability of a relationship. I believe that a, a therapist named John Gottsman has done studies and found that long-term happy couples have like 80 to 90 percent of their communications are positive compared to less successful couples where it's significantly less. So it's really important to try to, try to be nice. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it gets really simple. Be nice. What a concept, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very curious uh, why you called your book uh, Love and the More Perfect Union great question Martha um, <laughs> because well for two things one is because it's sort of f funny because I noticed that the um, Declaration of Independence of the United States read, reads to preserve domestic tranquility and create a more perfect union. And I thought they could have been talking about relationships, not a country. And mm -hmm. that got me thinking that really relationships are like their own little country. I'm in a relationship mm -hmm. with Sherry. We can create whatever rules we want so long as they're not so you know, that the police aren't going to come and haul us away. We can really pretty much create our own little country. So Love and the More Perfect Union is supposed to suggest that we, have, that we are like founding fathers and mothers of our own relationship, and we have the power to create exactly what we want in that relationship. Um, I call it tiny country creation. I mean, just to take one example, one obvious example, culturally there tends to be a clear preference towards monogamy as a cultural institution around marriage, but there's nothing to keep people from just agreeing to have multiple partners, to swing, to be polyamorous, whatever they, to be, to not have sex. I mean, there are all kinds of understandings that people can have, and it's not right or wrong as long as the partners consent. The only thing that makes something wrong is if a partner doesn't consent, and it happens anyway against their will. But other than that, it's just, you know, make your rules, make your country, and that's the point of this. It's not, don't just do it by the book because that's how your parents did it. This is a wonderful creative opportunity. Thank you for that. 
so what happens with uh, communication is often uh, people get uh, angry and uh, they say, okay, we know all this stuff, we know uh, about the five rooms, we know that I should uh, be conscious in my communication, but I just can't help all this anger that's coming up. So what is your advice on handling anger in a relationship? It's it's a wonderful question, and anger is like the most difficult emotion there is, I think, uh, for lots of people, because you want to honor it, but you don't want to be ruled by it. You don't want to destroy the relationship. You don't want to say hideous things that you can't unsay. So it's really, really a tricky one. And I have two responses that may or may not fit together. They may compete with it, con conflict with each other, but I'll leave that to you to decide. The first thing is that a very famous relationship teacher named Harville Hendricks, who wrote a book called Getting the Love You Want, and he's really kind of like, he's, he's really sort of founded the whole relationship studies world to some extent. He used to say that, that he, he used to encourage people to express their anger because he, he, it was sort of like a steam engine model. If you ventilate all that steam, it'll go away, it'll disperse, and then you have a fresh start. He's changed his mind about this because he's been reading up on neuroscience, and apparently neuroscience suggests that, again, I'll tell you, use you, us as an example, Martha, if I shouted angry things at you for three minutes, if I expressed my anger to you, it would literally sear new pathways in your brain that would make you afraid. Mm. So you would, you mm. would actually, I would be wiring vigilance into your nervous system. That is not what I want my beloved life partner or even barely tolerated life partner to be feeling. I want, I want my partner to be happy, positive, engaged, and comfortable in the cafe or the bedroom with me. So anger, expressed anger, appears to feed the fight or flight. I'll save the second thing till I come back. Okay, thank you very much. So more after this break. Mm -hmm. Best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio, your conscious lifestyle on steroids. The number one reason girls drop out of school in sub Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Come heal yourself. What is healing? Healing is nothing but connecting with your all-knowing higher self that already has solutions to all your problems and is always there to guide you. Through this show, we help you to connect with that you are and tap into that innate potential you have to transform your life and fly high. Please join me, your host Monica Goyal, every Sunday, 7 p.m. Pacific. Namaste. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. And 
and this is the last 15 minutes of today's show, Arrows Evolution. We're talking about how to create a positively pleasurable relationship with Carl Frankel. And I hope you've getting lots of value from today's show because I certainly have. So I just want to do a quick shout out since this is the last 15 minutes that Carl Frankel is a writer and journalist specializing in sex and relationships. And uh, he has one award winning book called, um, and maybe more because he has several books. And uh, his most recent book in uh, 2000 and uh, that was, uh, that received a 2015 Book of the Year prize from ASAC uh, is called Secrets of the Sex Masters where he interviewed 16 of the world's best sex teachers. And he's giving us his, uh, one of his books free. It is his uh, th- uh, 2013 book, Love and the More Perfect Union, which he's been talking about in today's show. And you can find it at this URL. That's tinyurl.com backslash Carl's Free Gift. Again, tinyurl.com backslash Carl's Free Gift. And you can find Carl at Intimate Art center.com that's arts with an s and center c-n-t-e-r so welcome back to the show carl uh, just before break we were talking about anger and you talked about uh, smearing uh, new pathways and uh, triggering the fight or flight mode uh, could you uh, elaborate more absolutely so the, the basic notion coming out of neuroscience is that when you express anger to somebody, you kind of hardwire a vigilant response to you in their body mind. And if you have a life partner who you want to have fun with, it's probably not good to be setting him or her up so that they are suspicious or afraid of you when they see you. So anger is is uh, counterproductive for a relationship. That's the general sort of theory that's emerging and that I embrace because I think The more fun you have, the better it is. Now, that being said, I have to honor that people are different and people have different tastes, and I've had different experiences. So if you are one of those people who go, I'd rather have my partner just say what's up for them because I will feel better about it, that's your tiny country. If that's the agreement you make with your partner, go for it. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. I will tell you that the neuroscience suggests that you might be taking a chance. But even in my relationship with Sherry, you know, sometimes she will be, I can just feel her being frustrated because she wants to give me a piece of her mind and she just can't bring herself to because it's against the rules. At times like that, I've actually said, please just say it. I'll feel better. So she goes something along that, well, you're such a jerk or something. I mean, not whatever it is. It doesn't matter what the content is. Mm-hmm. But just giving her the opportunity to meet her need for self-expression is a gift, and that gift can override the anger, and it can just, like, clear the air because really what's happening is people aren't really saying what's up for them. So this is complicated stuff, as I say. Everybody's going to come up with a different Mm. answer. The basic principle to me is try to find a way to deal with it nicely. Anger might feel good. It might feel great to give them a piece of their mind, and that'll teach them, and I feel so much better now. But the long-term consequences are quite negative. Mm. Thank you. So uh, two things uh, when it comes to anger for you. The first one is be aware of the pathways uh, that are being created when we just uh, uh, unleash on our partner. They might go into fight or flight mode and uh, that's uh, just counterproductive. The second one being uh, acknowledging and understanding that anger by itself is uh, of self-expression is, is a gift and that can actually uh, help things to clear. So two uh, different ways uh, in which to deal with anger. Yes, that's absolutely right. And if, if if there were a general principle, I'd say, you know, save the anger. Don't don't express it, and don't don't come from that courtyard courtroom place where you just like let them have it. Um, it's really tempting, but you know they say you know if you have an angry email to write, write it and then go away for a day and then come back in a day and see if you really still want to send it. It's the same thing in relationships. Don't go off on your partner take a breath, go away, and really give it some thought. Because unless you have one of those relationships that is premised in anger and the arguments lead to great makeup sex and those relationships exist, but if you're a person who really wants a harmonious relationship, you probably shouldn't be expressing your anger overtly. Mm. Okay. And um, so um, let's move away from anger and let's talk uh, very briefly about uh, freedom and intimacy. So how can one have freedom and intimacy uh, as well in their relationship? 
It's thank you for asking that, and it's a really one of those critical the critical points in a relationship. Actually, in my book, Love and the More Perfect Union, I talk about autonomy, in other words, freedom, um, intimacy, or connection. Hello, did I just lose a connection? No, no, you're here. Hello, we're still there. Hi. Okay, uh, yeah, so yeah, there's yeah, yeah. we're here. So, so there's intimacy. And there's connection, and there's also fairness, and that's an important piece of it. And this is kind of complicated to talk about, but basically base, two of the basic human needs we have are for autonomy, which is the freedom to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and connection, which is you know connecting with another human being, and that can be light connecting conversationally. It can be sexual connecting. There's all kinds. And what you find in relationships often is the kind of – a, a battle of needs, a conflict between needs. It often plays out on a gender basis. I, at least it has historically. I don't know if it does as much. But, you know, the guys go, go. I got to be me. I got to do what I want to go. I got to go to the game with my guys or I've got to have whatever it is with my guys. And the woman historically, and I don't want to be sexist about this, but I do think this is certainly one of the narratives that's out there. They want, they want a date with a guy, and the guy wants to go drinking with his friends. And these are both valuable, uh, uh, critically important things. We need autonomy, and we need intimacy. The problem is that we tend to um, value our own priorities over those of our partner. So if I'm an autonomy guy, and I really just want to be kind of left alone to do what I want to do, and I'll see my partner when it's convenient, and she is really wants to connect with me and eye gaze and do things together and share stuff, we're going to have to figure out a way where both our needs get met. And the first step is to honor the fact that both of these needs are valid. I have a right to my autonomy. My partner has a right to mm -hmm. connection. And there has to be fairness, so we each kind of get an equal amount of the goodies that really work for us. If in a relationship, partner A thinks autonomy is a betrayal. If you, if you really loved me, you wouldn't want to go to the bar with your friends and have a drink. You're creating a recipe for trouble because it's a basic human need, and it may be more in one person and less in another. Similarly, on the other side, if you go, God, she always wants to go out and have romantic dinners and all this stuff, and that was fine for a couple of years, but now, God, why does she want that? That's the same issue in the opposite direction. These needs are legitimate and valid, and we have to figure out a way to to give the part to not be in judgment of those needs and to give our partner what they want. Yeah, I love what you're sharing about the link between the three, autonomy, intimacy, and fairness. I can totally relate with what you're saying. I think a lot of times we try to control our partners and uh, limit our partner's freedom because we ourselves actually want to feel safe. And uh, coming from that place is, uh, like what you said, it's just a recipe for disaster. Yep. To I totally agree. And, we, you know, if freedom is... I mean, you have to ask what these needs mean. So my partner's freedom can mean it can mean they don't love me. It can mean they don't want to be with me. It can mean I'm not enough for them. It can mean they're going to want to go sleep with somebody else. We can impute all kinds of meanings to that core need of I have, I just need to be in charge of my life. And one of the big mistakes in relationships is that it, people think it means the individuals aren't autonomous. That's that's mm. the definition of a codependent relationship, right? Mm, codependent relationship. Okay, so uh, t just tell us quickly now, uh, as we're wrapping up the show, uh, what are you working on? Uh, another lovely question, Martha. Thank you. It's been really fun doing this with you, by the way. Um, I'm really <laughs> excited by my latest project. Um, it's an erotic utopian novel. It's actually going to be a series of your erotic utopian novels. Um, imagine a world where people had a healthy relationship towards sex and pleasure and celebration and, um, and, and, ha and a world that really was really healthy around this. So I'm writing a novel about an imaginary planet where, um, where people are really wise about sex and pleasure. So it's both a, an erotic novel, with all that, that implies, but it's also um, kind of an exploration of – it's a social satire of our sexual behaviors and habits and stories in this culture and kind of an invitation to imagine a world where we could really connect in a way that was really um, 
not just lewd, but celebratory. I mean, mm-hmm. ultimately, mm-hmm. all of creation is, uh, is, is, as creation is creative. It was born in an act of creation. It continues to create. It's the same creative impulse that makes us want to go make babies with somebody we meet. So we are part of a vast, vast, un- literally universal creative project. And what would happen mm-hmm. if we stepped into that? What would it mean? What would it feel like? What would our lives be like? Those are the questions I ask. Beautiful. Thank you. I really love this book now. Uh, uh, when you were telling me about it just now, I was like, huh? But now I totally <laughs> get it. It's so important to yeah. envision what kind of a world we want to live in. And uh, your book is going to uh, give us uh, the inclinations of possibilities. And uh, then we, we move on and we create it. So we have to end the go. show. Thank you so much for being on today. And uh, next week we have a different guest and we're going to be talking about how to worship the goddess and keep your balls. And uh, this is also the book title of David Bruce uh, Leonard. So tune in to Arrow's Evolution next week. <laughs>